Welcome uh, to Chatham House to our virtual round table series. I, I can see names, I can see many faces. Uh, I think it's, we are now really fully embedded into this new virtual landscape. And I think for all of us, certainly for me, the joy of this really tremendously difficult moment um, has been being able to invite um, such extraordinary thought leaders, with deep policy experience in Anne-Marie's case, academic experience in both of their cases, um, uh, from across the pond when we wouldn't otherwise have this opportunity because we know how difficult and busy their schedules are. So this is um, tremendously exciting, and very important. Um, the conversation today, I should say, I'm Leslie Vinjamori, I direct the US and Americas program here at Chatham House. Um, the conversation today is on the record, fully on the record, so I encourage you to um, tweet as much as you'd like um, and to share the conversation and to point people to it because it will also be recorded. So that's a word of warning as you ask questions that you are on the record. Um, the title of today's talk, does uh, COVID-19 spell the end of America's interest in globalization? Couldn't be more salient, more relevant, not only to the current moment, but as we know, um, America's complex relationship with the rest of the world is nothing new. Um, for many people, globalization was always about Americanization and it was inevitable that uh, as America's power declined in relative terms, so would globalization as we know it. And in the last several years, the attacks um, coming out of the US administration on multilateralism, on globalization in various forms, um, have really thrown up a lot of questions. We've seen increased protectionism. And I think the COVID-19 moment, if we can call it that, has raised a lot of questions for many of us about whether this is simply, as Richard Haas says, accelerating uh, previous trends, whether it's a game changer, whether it's a moment of opportunity. We have two extraordinary thinkers here to weigh in on this. They've already written extensively about this, certainly even long before the current moment. Um, Steve Walt is a professor, uh, the Robert M. Renee Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's previously taught at the University of Chicago at Princeton University. He's written many books. He is a regular contributor to foreign policy. We all read his words. He's a regular visitor to Chatham House. Um, his recent book was the occasion of a recent visit, The Hell of Good Intentions, the America, American Foreign Policy Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy. But I personally continue to be a fan of his first book, 1987, The Origins of Alliances. It's not very often that you write a book in 1987 that continues to be uh, one of the most important foundational books in the field of international relations. And, and I think uh, in Steve Walt's case, he's clearly defined himself from that moment on as one of the leading thinkers in the world, um, realist scholars of international relations. So it is a pleasure and honor to have you back. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, well known to anybody who reads anything, um, is president and CEO of one of America's leading and most innovative and impactful think tanks, New America. She is also university professor emerita at Princeton University. Um, she was the director of policy planning at the United States State Department from 2009 to 2011. She was the first female ever to hold that role. Um, and to her very great credit, spoke openly about that, wrote about that in the Atlantic, wrote a book about what it means to be a woman in international affairs and have great impact. Um, but previous to being at the State Department, she was the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of International Affairs at Princeton from 2002 to 2009. So we have extraordinary speakers, and I will turn it over to uh, the two of you immediately, first to Steve and then Anne to, to Anne-Marie. We will then open it up. We have some great people on the call, well over, well, a lot, <laughs> is all I'll say. Um, but Steve, over to you. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to see Anne-Marie and be online with her. I normally prefer being sort of across a dinner table with our families. Uh, uh, so even if it's just online, it's nice to see her. And I want to thank uh, you, Leslie, for the invitation and everybody for Zooming in. I want to make three preliminary points and then sort of lay out a quick argument. 
Uh, first point is if uh, the last five years and especially COVID-19 have taught us anything, it's that uh, international affairs can take some very surprising turns in very short order. So we should all be a little bit humble about our ability to forecast the future at this point. Um, second, for me, the question is not whether the United States will be interested in globalization. Of course it will. Uh, the United States is not going to stop trading, not going to stop investing. It's not going to shut down its embassies, leave all international organizations and bring all the troops home. The real question is what form globalization is going to take and what the American role within that new form is likely to be. And I'll give my answer to that at the end. Uh, and then finally, uh, I don't think COVID-19 is going to transform the basic nature of world politics. Uh, the 1918 influenza epidemic didn't do that and neither will this. What I mean by that is that states will still be the basic building block of world politics. Major powers are still gonna compete for power and influence. Global institutions, non-state actors, transnational networks will all play their role, but we are not going to see an explosion of global governance coming out of uh, this event. Now, with that as background, my main claim is simple. Uh, COVID-19 is going to accelerate the various trends that were already underway, and that's going to change the nature of globalization and the U.S. role within it. And let me sketch this out quickly. Uh, first of all, globalization was under siege before COVID-19 hit. Governments were increasingly wary of ever expanding market access. You saw that in Brexit. You saw that in the election of Donald Trump. The decoupling of the Chinese and American economies that was already beginning. And it's worth remembering this was not just a right-wing phenomena in the West. This was part of Bernie Sanders' agenda, too. It's worth also remembering that Hillary Clinton opposed the Trans-Pacific Partnership when she ran for president in 2016. So this was happening uh, before COVID. Uh, there were also growing concerns about immigration, refugee flows, the resurgence of nationalism, as people began to worry about preserving their own cultural values and way of life. Uh, COVID to me is accelerating both those trends. Uh, it's now clear that having lots of people moving around the world all the time is a public health challenge for which we have not been prepared. Walls have gone up in a variety of places. I can't fly to Europe at the moment. Uh, and they won't come down back to pre-COVID-19 levels uh, for quite a while. Similarly, the supply chains that were created to reduce costs and maximize economic efficiency turned out to be vulnerable both to changing political fortunes, the Sino-American relationship, for example, but also to a dangerous virus. So instead of just-in-time production in the future, we're going to see more just-in-case preparations. That means bigger stockpiles, diverse supply chains, more domestic production capacity, even if it costs more. We're not going to be quite as globalized as we were before. Um, second big trend uh, is that we're going to see a world that is less free than it was before. Uh, I think the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations all believed U.S.-led globalization was going to foster a world that was increasingly free, increasingly democratic. Uh, and uh, Leslie, you referred to that in saying that this was sort of globalization under American auspices with American values in the lead. I think these assumptions turned out to be wrong. Uh, and even before the pandemic hit, authority, authoritarianism was having a good decade. Uh, China wasn't liberalizing, neither was Russia. Uh, according to Freedom House, 2019 was the 14th consecutive year in which global freedom declined. States like Poland, Hungary, Turkey, all headed in authoritarian directions. And our various efforts to spread democracy in places like Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, were mostly costly failures. Well, the pandemic is going to make this trend worse uh, because in emergencies, even well-established democracies start restricting civil liberties, start concentrating power in the center. In a war, you get censorship, surveillance, suppression of dissent, greater management of the economy. We're seeing all those things happen now. Governments of all kinds are imposing controls over their citizens, and some leaders are using it as an opportunity to grant themselves extraordinary powers. Now, many of those countries will relax those restrictions going forward, but probably not all of them. 
And of course, if Donald Trump is reelected in November, the United States will continue its slow drift away from the rule of law and towards soft authoritarianism. My bottom line here is that globalization 2.0 is gonna be a world that's both less open, as I just described, but also somewhat less free. Now, what does that mean for the United States uh, and its role in the world? Well, first of all, this, uh, our handling of the pandemic has been a serious blow to the image of America as a competent country that knows what it's doing. Uh, states around the world are more likely to listen to us if they think we know uh, how to respond to crises, that we have answers to problems, and we look like serial blunderers uh, right now. I think this is going to have a lasting effect on American influence around the world. It's not entirely new. Some prior events had already begun to tarnish that aura of competence, but this is going to make it worse. Uh, second, the pandemic is going to have significant and lasting economic effects. Uh, we are piling up truly extraordinary levels of debt at home. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated or at least exposed uh, the impact of inequality, inequities in health care in the United States. And as a result, the United States is going to be under tremendous pressure to do more at home once the pandemic is done. We were overextended before COVID-19, and I think most Americans are going to care a lot more about having a job, having their kids be able to go to school, being able to get medical treatment if they need it, than they are going to care about which corrupt Afghan politician is currently ruling in Kabul or Tripoli. Uh, Costly military programs, we're going to be a tougher sell in the years ahead. Now, I don't think that's going to lead to isolationism in the strict sense or to radical disarmament, and I don't think it should. But trying to be the indispensable nation in every corner of the world is not going to be sustainable either economically or politically. So let me close by suggesting what I think the United States should do and what, global, what our global engagement should look like after this is over. Well, first and most obviously, we should be participating in the global effort to defeat the virus. And a lot of this is, of course, already happening within the scientific community, which tends to operate on a transnational basis anyway. The US government should be encouraging this rather than trying to get in the way, as it has in a number of places. Uh, America first turns out to be a really bad approach to immunology. Um, second, we should be actively engaged with other countries to deal with other global problems like climate change, the security of nuclear materials, disease prevention, the management of refugee flows. And to the extent that we can, we should try to wall those issues off from the areas where we're going to be competing, especially uh, with China. Third, as Sino-American relations deteriorate, and, and I expect they're going to, we should be actively engaged trying to lead a balancing coalition in Asia. I'm happy to say more about that if anybody's interested, but that's where I think most of our geopolitical attention will need to be. Uh, and then finally, we should continue to favor a globalized economy, a mostly open world economy. We should resist the temptation to indulge in overt protectionism. But future trade deals are going to have to be a lot less ambitious and a lot less intrusive to avoid provoking the kinds of domestic backlashes we've seen in recent years and to try and create a global economy that is less vulnerable either to political shifts or to events like the one we're all living through. This is going to be a less prosperous world. It's not going to be as economically efficient a world, but it may also be a more stable and less turbulent world. And I think many people around the world would welcome a globalization that was somewhat more stable, even somewhat boring, somewhat predictable, as opposed to what we're currently living through. Let me stop there and listen to Anne Marie. Thank you, Steve. Um, a lot on the table. I have read enough of Anne Marie's work to know that she's going to give us a different perspective. So, Anne Marie, over to you. Thanks, Leslie. And and first of all, I have to say it's it's great to see lots of old friends uh, on the, uh, on the screen. I actually have not been doing uh, much of this kind of work uh, for reasons I will will explain. So it's lovely to see people. It's always wonderful to be with Steve, and he and I actually do agree more than probably either of us and some of you uh, 
will have expected. <laughs> and we softened our opposition over the years. And I have to say, I started exactly where he did as I was thinking about notes. My first point was predictions are, are impossible right now. I mean, the idea that any of us can actually predict, uh, even with COVID, of course, but, you know, depending what happens in November in the United States, we, we will go one way or the other. And only a fool would be predicting the uh, election right now. So I start with that. I'm going to talk about my expectations, not predictions. Uh, and then I want to talk just about the, how we think about globalization before I, I get into an argument. Because uh, I, you know, if, if you look at the world as a whole, it's a steady increase right, <laughs> from tiny city states to a world that is deeply interconnected. And I think of it as waves of globalization in, in a world in which the uh, sea levels are rising so that the tides keep getting further they go further up the beach, but then they recede. And so if you look at the globalization wave before World War I, the famous Keynes quote that we all know, obviously you had a surge of globalization, then it recedes, then it surges again, then it recedes. But each time it actually, it, the, the, even when it recedes, the world is more globalized than it was before. So I start with that. I think though it is true, and I totally agree with Steve, that globaliz this wave of globalization, the 1990s, the aughts, is receding. It was receding before COVID and COVID will, will accelerate that, but it was absolutely already on the wane. And that was part of what we were seeing with authoritarianism. And indeed, if you think of David Goodhart's book, The Road to Somewhere, you know, he's making the case, this is a, this is a, a resistance to those who have profited from globalization from from the, the, the global elites. Uh, so it is ebbing. Um, I actually think that is a good thing. Uh, Steve said at the end, maybe we prefer a more stable globalization, even if it's a little less prosperous. I would say more generally that it is it is way past time that many, at least the United States, I'm not gonna speak for Europe, but the United States needs to focus at home. And one of the reasons I left to, to academia to be head of New America in 2013, so that's when the Obama administration is still uh, in office, our schools are completely broken. Our healthcare system is a shambles. We, we have deaths of despair, right? Life expectancy going down in large parts of our population. I mean, really among advanced democracies, the United States is broken and our political system is broken. It's not a democracy. You can't get a majority of people across the country want all sorts of things and the political system uh, cannot deliver. So I would say as far back as it, certainly the second half, second Obama administration, we were sliding in the world because of manifest incompetence on a whole host of domestic issues. And China was saying that then. They were saying, look at our, our, our role in lifting up our people. And you looked at the United States and we were the bottom of the league tables in lots of things. Not in technology, not in Silicon Valley, all of that, but in terms of actually taking care of our people. So to the extent that, that this wave of globalization recedes and what it means, is that we tax our companies, we regulate our companies, we invest at home more in supply chains that are closer to home and more resilient. That is a good thing. Not completely, and of course it can't be completely. There I agree with Steve. You know, we're not, if you just look at our people, which I'll come back to, the supply chains that remain the, the core of a globalized economy, that's not going to disappear, but it's going to rebalance. So uh, then let me just say also, though, I think where COVID comes in here and where it accelerates this trend, um, I actually think we're moving, we'll move much faster toward additive manufacturing, so toward 3D manufacturing. I don't agree with Steve that it's going to be a wave of stockpiling. I think it's going to be just in time delivery, but through local manufacturing. And again, if you've been looking at the future of work, if you've been talking to all the people who've been looking at AI, robotics, uh, and 3D manufacturing, they've been talking for almost a decade about bringing manufacturing much closer to home. And I will say that I think the starting with manufacturing medical equipment, masks, 
uh, PPE, uh, even ventilators, what you're seeing across the United States is suddenly people realizing we can do this here. That will take at least a decade for that shift. It's not gonna be overnight, but COVID will accelerate it. Uh, and similarly, a, uh, a shift to different kinds of jobs, much more emphasis on services. So much of what's happening with COVID was gonna happen anyway. And lots of companies right now are taking this opportunity to automate as fast as they can. It's, it's gonna be a painful, painful shift to a different uh, equilibrium in terms of services and higher, higher added value uh, jobs in the US and a different kind of manufacturing. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a rebalancing, and I'd say it's a rebalancing toward a more embedded liberalism. To go back to John Ruggie's famous article, and I think he got it right, that liber global liberalism only works when it's sufficiently embedded to cushion the distributed consequences, and it hasn't been in the United States. So then let me go, though, to a, a way where I think I do disagree with Steve. I mean, it would be no fun and we wouldn't recognize each other if we <laughs> agreed on everything. Uh, but he says, you know, we're not going to see an explosion of global governance. I disagree. I agree with him if, if, if by what he means is some kind of global government, absolutely not. Uh, and indeed, uh, this crisis is showing the weaknesses of many of the post-war institutions. The United Nations has been absent from this debate. I don't think I've seen the UN even in headlines for months and months. The World Health Organization, yes, but otherwise so many of the global institutions that we think of as part of the post-war order uh, are, are crippled in many ways, but that was also, that was true beforehand. This is accelerating it. But where I think you're gonna see, a, and you are seeing an explosion, explosion of global governance is what I would call global problem solving. If governance is people coming together and solving public problems, you're seeing an explosion of that in whether it is, you know, pharmaceutical companies, whether it is billionaires from and, and uh, folks from philanthropies coming together, whether it's CEOs, and it's really been quite remarkable. I mean, it's little known, but the CEOs of big pharma are coming together on a regular basis and, and sharing information uh, they rarely would. If you look at Bill Gates's uh, Epic, which focuses on investing in vaccines, you look at scientists, uh, civic groups, and increasingly those groups working with more small and medium-sized states. Uh, it's interesting that the hundred states that want an investigation in the World Health Organization, the U.S. is bashing China, but that group of a hundred states was led by Australia. And there have been a number of examples of smaller and medium-sized states just saying, we're just not going to wait for all these folks. So I think where you're going is a kind of two-tiered world order where yes there in the international order there will be more great power competition um, to me that's a highly indulgent power game but it will be <laughs> the major governments that have an interest in playing it will absolutely continue to play it uh, and there I, I don't I wouldn't probably disagree with Steve's offshore balancing to go back to his very first book uh, view of what we should be doing in Asia but that's the international order. At the same time, we're going to see a strengthening of the global order. The global order where really the best example is the Paris Agreement in which there's suddenly room for non-party stakeholders, again, for business, for universities, for civic groups, for scientists, and also for criminals. It's not all good by any means. You'll see different hubs where you actually can bring together the right people to solve problems and they'll be measured more by competence uh, than by any kind of pedigree. I expect to see that much more regionally uh, and in, again in different issue areas. Um, just to conclude though, in terms of the wh where the U.S. is, I think I agree uh, with Steve that we've taken a huge hit with response to COVID, but to me that again is just the latest round because on so many measures, I think our incompetence uh, was evident. Uh, but if I look at the long-term of the United States and of Europe, I actually see 
a different kind of globalization and a very strong globalization because of the changing nature of our demography. And again, we're looking at five to 10 to 20 years, but the United States in 20 years and already among our young people is no longer majority white. All of the big groups in the United States, the Latinx, African-Americans, Indian Americans, Asian Americans, all of those folks have ties to the world, very strong ties to the whole world rather than just to Europe. And as they take power, we are going to see all sorts of commercial, educational, and social ties that you can cabin. And I do agree that we need to protect domestically more first, as I said, but you can't actually stop. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, as I said, I disagree on, on the nature of the global order and on the kinds of global governance, but I think Steve and I both agree in terms of the big trends of globalization uh, and where the U.S. will be for the next 10 years. Okay, that was a lot on the table and I really appreciated it. I can see a lot of us did because there are a long list of questions. I'm going to ask one quickly first and then and then immediately open it up and say, so you know, roughly where we're heading. Mark Leonard, Jennifer Lynn, Lou Lucan, Sophie Gidden, and we have over 80 people on the call just so the two of you are aware. Um, but I want to ask one question. I guess it goes to what's well, to both of your presentations, but th this question of openness, um, Steve. And also, I guess, Anne-Marie, but both of you, this question of polarization that we hear so much about, that we talk so much about, that we think so much about. Um, you know, Steve, is it not possible that, you know, we're not less open because, of course, the specific nature of COVID-19 is asking for transparency, right? It's asking for knowing where the pandemic's coming from, for understanding what's going on inside of China and inside of states. Is it not possible in your view that, you know, even though, yes, it's a crisis and we need more surveillance and all that sort of thing, that there's something about the specific nature of this particular pandemic that will lead people to want more openness? And, and then I guess, you know, as part of that, I know, I mean, I really take your point and I respect it. And I think it's the right one that we don't know where things are going. It's too soon. But polarization is what everybody talks about. Um, and there have been a few studies that have come out recently that suggest that, wow, Americans agree on a whole lot surrounding the pandemic, not least 93% agree that, you know, scientists and researchers should be respected, but also that there's some signs that, there's, that there might be less polarization as a result of this. Could you just comment on that briefly? And then again, we'll come to Mark, Jennifer, Lou, Sophie, Gidden, and, and a whole list of other people. Yeah, I, I hope you can see and hear me because my screen has frozen, but- um, Barb, You look fantastic in your frozen position and we can hear you. Okay, yeah, no, I can, I can certainly, you're coming in loud and clear uh, audially. Uh, so when I was referring to openness, I meant uh, basically economic openness and interconnectedness in that way also to some degree movements of people. But there is this second uh, element of it, which is openness to information, the, the willingness of governments uh, to share uh, knowledge and data about what's going on, and also, of course, their uh, desire to keep an eye on everybody. Uh, so what we're seeing is, you know, with varying degrees, depending on which country you're in, uh, you know, testing, tracing, cell phone apps that uh, monitor where people are. Um, and I think this is uh, eventually going to be the new normal. Uh, Big Brother is going to watch us even more extensively uh, than he is already, and will do it for partly uh, health reasons, you can make the, the case for that, but in many cases, there's gonna be monitoring that has a non-health dimension to it as well. And I think, uh, you know, five years from now, if we're all traveling again in some parts of the world, you know, when you get to the airport, your temperature will be taken, your throat will be swabbed, and an app will be added to your phone so everybody knows where you are, and that's not going to be strictly for, uh, for health reasons as well. So this business of having more information out there doesn't necessarily uh, reduce the ability of some government someplace to then keep an eye on their citizens uh, in ways that we might find uncomfortable in other parts of the world. Uh, polarization, you're absolutely right. There's lots of evidence, uh, both anecdotal and some survey evidence of uh, some agreement about, uh, about you know, the need for a national response uh, to the pandemic here in the United States and elsewhere. Um, there's a powerful consensus, for example, you know, 60 to 75 percent 
suggesting that the United States should not open up too fast, uh, despite what a number of governments and despite what the Trump administration uh, clearly wants. Uh, but I think polarization uh, will continue to be a really significant problem for some time to come. Um, and among other things, we are about to head into the, the really intense part of the presidential election cycle. And that's going to fuel this uh, because it's going to be an extraordinarily nasty campaign uh, for all of the obvious reasons. And that's going to, I think, reinforce a lot of the tribalism that has been making American politics dysfunctional for the last decade or more, and which uh, Anne-Marie spoke about already, uh, I think, quite eloquently. So polarization is not going away anytime soon. Um, I, so I would, let me just speak to the, the polarization piece. Uh, I agree with Steve uh, nationally, and but for so many reasons, that is a function of a really broken political system. Right? We've only got, we have 40% of, of Americans are neither Democrat nor Republican. Uh, and it, it, you've got very, very low turnout. Uh, and m many, many, many Americans not voting because they don't think it makes any difference uh, which side uh, is in place. Uh, and then you've got a primary system that, of course, plays to the extremes uh, on both sides. Where you are seeing less polarization, and it's a, it's a part of the argument that I, I uh, didn't give enough, uh, I, I didn't have enough time for, is, is in cities. Uh, where mayors, Republican mayors and Democrat mayors are on the front lines and they are the people who've got to deliver. They're not accountable for ideology, but for performance. Uh, and they, again, are playing a much more important role globally. Again, we know this with uh, Bloomberg's 7,000 mayors, his covenant for climate change, uh, but increasingly you're seeing that with health also as mayors are, ex are exchanging information about what different uh, authorities are doing and how to open up, and there's much less polarization there. Steve's right that there's no way to get that uh, sort of level or, or, or sort of more accurate representation, I think, of where Americans are, that won't translate to the national political system until we have major political reform. But uh, mayors and governors uh, are playing an increasing role and an increasing global role in this kind of polycentric uh, order that I'm describing. Mark. Hi, thank you very much to both of you. It was absolutely fascinating um, talks. I was just wondering, um, where, because I think there are two ways that people are starting to uh, think about how the world order and globalization it, it could go in the future. Um, one way is towards greater polarization, that you get a bigger split between, you know, bipolar world between China and America, open versus closed. The, um, this distinction between the, the what Amory talked about as the global order and the international order, Biden versus Trump. Um, the other way is thinking that COVID could actually scramble distinctions and you could actually see a big convergence around these different things so that, you know, rather than open versus closed, what you get is authoritarian systems and democracies becoming more and more like each other, China and America becoming more and more like each other in terms of how they go around throwing their weight around in different areas and, and the policy mixes and the technological base. Um, and uh, the, it's impossible increasingly to keep the global order from the international order apart. And so you get weaponized interdependence. And in fact, the global order becomes a tool for great power competition. And um, in that sense, um, you know, in fact, it, Trump is seen more as a, 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 as a, as a symptom of, of structural changes within the US. And we, obviously he's got his peculiar pathologies, which will hopefully disappear if he loses the election in November. But quite a lot of the, the policy mix, particularly on globalization, which he's stood for, will remain part of the American political system. It'd be interesting to hear which of those um, frameworks you think is, is more uh, plausible and uh, what that means for people outside of, of the US as well. And I should just say, uh, Mark, you violated the rule, which is you didn't introduce yourself, but uh, so it's Mark Leonard. We all know him. <laughs> Not well, yeah. We all know him. Um, we all love him. Uh, the head of the European Council on Foreign Relations, for those of you who might not know him. Um, but who wants to take that first? Anne-Marie, would you like to take that? 
Yeah, I mean, Mark, it's, uh, I, I, it's great to see and hear you. Indeed, we were supposed to have you to dinner and it was canceled by COVID and, and back in March. Um, but so I, I think it's a wonderful way of thinking about it. Um, I think there, even, even if Biden is reelected, I think there is more convergence between the US and China to the extent that they are both large nations who want to play the power game rather than focusing on the existential global threats, right? I mean, yes, Biden will pay more attention to climate change, but even on climate change, these are the nations for whom you know, they can play great power politics. Uh, and there are proposals circulating that we, you know, need to return to the concert of Europe uh, and the big powers are, gonna, are, are going to rule the world again. And that's because the big powers will be at the table. But what I'm arguing is there are, the problems are too great and too existential and climate change, biodiversity, global health, migration, these affect all of us and people just aren't gonna be shut out. The global order is far more participatory. It's far more participatory for small and medium sized states and it's far more participatory for all the people, women, people of color, men who are excluded from you know, the halls of traditional foreign policy, I think to, to um, accept being cut out. In some ways, just like you're seeing governors and mayors refusing to accept the dictates uh, of federal governments. So I actually think your point is well taken. Um, I'm, you know, I hope that the United States will not continue converging toward authoritarianism. There the election makes a huge difference. But in terms of a relative focus on the international order versus global problem solving, I think US and China will, will be closer. And over to you, Steve. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, so let me imagine two worlds. I mean, the most, uh, one obvious one is, uh, as you said, a sort of return to some kind of rough bipolarity where each of the two major powers, the United States and China, organizes its own orbit of allies uh, and works very hard to bring as many other countries uh, along with it uh, as possible. To some degree also tries to sow discord in the other side's camp as well. We've kind of seen that, uh, that story in the past. Uh, I think that's the most likely outcome for reasons I'll say in a second. Um, uh, the second option you also kind of sketched, and that's one where sort of neither the United States nor China is quite strong enough nor quite attractive enough to really attract a large uh, sphere of like-minded states around it. And you kind of have all the medium powers uh, saying that they're not really going to follow anyone. They're going to try and, you know, balance in between or carve their own path or organize multilateral forums. And Anne-Marie referred to this a little bit in talking about the role that Aus Australia has played. And I think that possibility is out there, particularly if the United States and China both uh, stumble repeatedly. I think the reason I would bet on the first world, though, is that, you know, even uh, with all that's gone on, uh, these two countries be extraordinarily powerful for the uh, foreseeable future, you know, easily commanding somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of the world economy in the United States and China alone. Uh, they are certainly going to view each other as rivals, but they're also going to work very hard to try and have uh, as many friends as possible, uh, uh, particularly if we get uh, past uh, the Trump era. And they're not going to be very tolerant of countries trying to sort of balance between them. The United States is not going to be willing to defend Europe if Europe wants to be neutral in the Sino-American uh, rivalry. So I think that's where we're headed kind of uh, at the global level, although I can imagine a world uh, that has a lot more flexibility built into it, particularly if the United States is, as Anne-Marie suggested, you know, completely preoccupied at home, and if China's model turns out to stumble in various ways so that it doesn't look like a particularly attractive alternative. Okay, I'm going to Go to Jennifer and Megan uh, next. Jennifer, I know, was on one of our previous calls, and I never got to her. <laughs> so, and um, and is at Dartmouth, and also a non-resident fellow and associate fellow on our program. And and then Megan Green, who I think has to leave a little bit early. Where Jennifer, can you um, hear me? Yes, I can. I'm here. Um, thanks so much, you guys, for this this wonderful program. Um, so I 
my question actually had a lot of bearing on what what Steve was just discussing and Anne Marie touched on some of these issues too. So I'd love to hear from either of you. Uh, Steve, you mentioned a balancing the US should lead a balancing coalition in East Asia. And I just wanted to ask about the feasibility of that, both from the standpoint of international politics and also from the standpoint of US domestic politics. So even before COVID, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of interest in East Asia about balancing against China. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of concerns and, and so on. But if, if you look at where the rubber meets the road, Japan is the country with the most capability that would be an essential member of a balancing coalition. And Japan, in terms of its defense activities and spending, has barely budged over the past few decades. Um, you know, others, we see more interest, Australia, India, but their, the capabilities that they could bring to a coalition would be relatively low. And then, of course, we have much smaller countries that have basically no capabilities to bring at all. Um, and then there's the issue of, well, if they're not interested, then how to get the American voters more interested than the countries surrounding China in joining a balancing coalition. And you mentioned it would be, it's going to be difficult in a post-COVID world to, to get the American people to support these uh, great overseas adventures of ours. Um, I'm Megan Green. I'm a senior fellow at Chatham House and also at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and I was struck by something you both touched on. I mean, you both seem to be in agreement that we'll have to focus much more at home. Um, and that goes especially for the US, but I think for a lot of the developed world. Um, what surprises me is kind of your optimism that we'll actually do something about any of that. So, I mean, I'm writing a lot on inequality these days. And so, you know, I look at the people who have lost their jobs already, and they're exactly those people who got none of the wage gains that we saw over the past decade. Things like this really need to be addressed. And I, I sort of wonder when you say we need to focus more on what's going on at home and we'll, we'll be able to do something about it, what exactly that looks like. And I wonder actually if globalization might be part of the answer in that it seems to me that top-down nation-led globalization um, might wane, as you're both suggesting, um, but that bottom-up digital globalization might increase a lot and fundamentally change the way we work in the way that we're participating in a Chatham House event, for example, right now, even though you know, the three of us are sitting in the US and that, that would have been really difficult before. Um, none of us actually have to be anywhere to do our jobs um, in the kind of work that those of us on this call are doing. And is that part of the solution or are there more um, sort of invasive kind of NHS type, social security type solutions that you guys are expecting? And of course, Megan, we should add that there's no reason why we couldn't have done this before. We've just changed the way that we think, right? This needs yeah. must. Um, who would like, I guess, Steve, since you um, have the big question from uh, Professor Jennifer Lind at Dartmouth College. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to say something about each one. Well, I, you know, I've written a lot about this. I think the United States has an interest in uh, preventing China from dominating Asia, becoming a sort of regional hegemon, and the United States can't do that without having close alliance ties in Asia. Um, that was, I think, something that both the Bush administration and the Obama administration understood, and they were moving the United States in that direction. I think that's why TPP was uh, actually a smart policy for strategic reasons as much as economic reasons as well. Um, this, I think, is primarily <clears throat> a diplomatic challenge uh, for us, with, uh, working with Asian partners in a variety of ways. and sort of walking a rather fine line so that China is understood by Asians to be the country that is disturbing the status quo there and that the United States is simply trying to preserve it. If we appear to be too out front, too confrontational, then that tends to make our Asian allies nervous and they distance themselves from us in a variety of ways. Uh, all your points about you know, sort of burden sharing, uh, those are familiar ones in alliances that we've dealt with uh, for a long time. I don't think it's going to be an easy task, but I do think it's a, a doable uh, task as well. Um, I, I, um, I think Megan's question is a great one. I'll just say I, I wrote a, a piece a couple of weeks ago that was a little bit tongue in cheek, but it was basically suggesting that the big winner of the uh, US presidential campaign was actually Bernie Sanders. Uh, because uh, partly as a result of COVID, his agenda 
now is closer to being adopted than it would have been if he'd actually been uh, the nominee. I mean, you look at what role the U.S. government is now playing in the American economy. It's never been greater than it is uh, today. Uh, if you uh, consider all of the problems we're discovering with having people's health care tied to their employment, uh, you know, you couldn't imagine a better argument for uh, Medicare for all. Um, so in some respects, you know, you could easily, I think, see uh, a real push to a movement in a sort of government-led measures to address inequality that uh, were unheard of. And there's even some indications that Biden, who was not uh, naturally inclined in that direction before, is now increasingly open to that, that the Democratic Party realizes if they do win in November, they're going to have to come in with something other than just business as usual to address all of these problems. So I think, you know, here in the United States, you could actually see, um, if not quite the kind of Bernie Sanders revolution, uh, something closer to maybe the Elizabeth Warren revolution that she was promising as well. And Anne Marie? Well, so on the first, uh, Jennifer, it is a great question. I. I I agree with you, uh, and I would say the same in, in Europe, that uh, it, I think even, even our European allies, much less our Asian allies, don't want to be led in a way that balances against another nation what they want. Uh, they want to maintain uh, ties. They want us present, certainly in Asia, uh, but they don't want to have to choose. Uh, and I'll just say in, in Europe, even before COVID, you know, and under Obama, we, we couldn't keep our allies from joining the Asian Investment uh, Infrastructure Bank. Uh, we could, can't get our allies not to take Huawei, uh, 5G. Uh, they don't want to choose. And they, they are, uh, Steve's right, you know, we can, we can do this with a lighter hand than, than pushing them to balance against. But I think the whole idea of, blocks of alliances balancing is, is really a 20th century concept. Uh, and I think we're, again, for all the reasons I've been saying, the much greater interpenetration of societies uh, at the, again, the mayor level, the governor level, the business level uh, makes that, that much harder to do. Uh, on the um, ground up digital globalization, I agree, it's a great question, Megan. I do think that's what we're going to see in various ways. It is fascinating to watch the number of American cities that are have now deputy mayors for international affairs who are thinking about how their cities can plug in. And as we go online, you can simultaneously be more present in your community. One of the things that's happening with COVID is we're actually, I, I have not lived in Princeton for seven years. I live here, but I'm not actually here most of the time. Suddenly, and in part because people are working with other community members on uh, the pandemic, you can be more present in your community, but if you're somebody who used to give chess lessons or lessons of any kind, only domestically, you know, only, only in your community, the piano lessons, suddenly you can do that everywhere. So I think that is a possible way forward. Uh, in terms of the overall national agenda, though, we will only get what Steve's talking about, which I firm, fervently believe we need. I mean, we, right now you can only get health care if you have a job, and a lot of people can only get food if they go to school. Uh, but that means we need a whole suite. We need a Biden and we need a Democratic Senate and House. I, I, I don't think we're going to get that for a long time to come. I think the change is going to be at the, na at the state level uh, and then political reform before we get it at the national level. I hope I'm wrong. I, I just want to remind us what in the, the Economist this week, goodbye globalization, they know, you know, digital trade is thriving, but its scale is modest. The sales abroad of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft are equivalent to just 1.3% of world exports. I know digital globalization is a much bigger concept, but it's interesting. Um, Hans has a follow-up on that. And then I want to bring Lord Wallace into the conversation. We haven't had you on one of our virtual roundtables yet. And then uh, Lou, and, and we, again, we continue to have many people. So Hans, and then over to Lord Wallace. Thank you. Hans Kundanani um, from Chatham House. I just wanted to follow up on, on what Megan said and link it back to something that Anne-Marie said earlier on and, and, and think uh, and this, is, this is really around the, the internal problems in, in the United States that, um, that you were both talking about. And I sort of wonder whether some of this means that we need to slightly think about America's role in the world in a slightly different way. 
um, it's, um, it's sort of a common place to say that the United States is in relative decline. But when you look at something like the deaths of despair that you mentioned, uh, Anne-Marie, you know, declining uh, life expectancy in the United States for the last, I think, four years. Um, and it's not clear whether that's a blip. That could just be the new trend. Um, this is something that is not supposed to happen and, and you know, really only happens in very rare circumstances. Um, if one thinks that through, it seems to me it raises the question of whether the United States is not just in relative decline, but possibly in absolute decline, which is an absolutely shocking kind of question even to be asking. And clearly there are other indicators that one could look at that would point in a different direction. But if it's true that life expectancy is now going down in the United States, that is an indicator of absolute decline. Um, this is a question, it seems to me, which nobody's really discussing. We've had lots of discussions around whether the, you know, around the US being in relative decline and what that means. I wonder if now that's the question we have to ask. Hmm. Uh, and, and Lord Wallace, if you would introduce yourself. Um, William Wallace used to work at Chatham House, then the London School of Economics, now the House of Lords. Um, Amory, you sound wonderfully optimistic. Uh, with a liberal view of the world, and I, I just wish to question that, because one of the things that worries me most is, who is going to hold the global order together? And we do rely on a network of international organizations, many of them set up a very long time ago, many of them now deeply in trouble, the World Trade Organization, arguably the World Health Organization, is having a mixed war at the present moment, and we then face, as you have said, the challenges of climate change, rising immigration uh, and digitization, all of which are going to require a lot more international cooperation. Now, you quoted David Goodhart, who after all wrote about citizens of nowhere, uh, or citizens of anywhere, um, who are of course the liberal elite like you and me, who travel and think uh, broadly, um, but who have to influence governments and who are losing influence on governments in a very large number of countries. You are optimistic, I think, that we can rely on entrepreneurs, the new successful heads of, of big companies, the sort of Mark Zuckerbergs and Elon Musks, perhaps, no. uh, to look after the world uh, for us. I'm not quite so sure about that, and I'm not sure that there are many other places uh, than the United States where big city mayors can do much either. Uh, so I just wish to ask, uh, how do we manage to create or to maintain the liberal international elite that holds the world together through these organizations in rather hostile domestic circumstances in all our countries? I'm going to, uh, Lou Lukens wanted to ask a question, but there's a very loud horn outside of his flat, so he's not going to. I'm going to give it to Tricia. And I, I just have to interject one thing, which is, you know, I wonder on the citizens of nowhere, citizen, you know, that I'm not so sure that there are any Americans, however elite, that are actually in the citizens of anywhere category. I would kind of put that out there. I actually think nationalism is really robust in, amongst Americans, but I might be wrong. Um, Trisha, it's your, over to you. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this. I'm a freelance writer. Um, my question was that, you know, right now, as we know, America has really become massively distrusted and disrespected, uh, not just in its handling of COVID um, foremost right now, but on the dominance of U.S. big tech companies, on its bullying on Iran and China, on its public criticism of any and every other country pitted against each other. And now we know that middle power countries are coalescing over issues of importance, on climate, on global health, as we know. Can the world afford to decouple from the US? Thanks. And just one more from Giddon, and then I'll turn it back to the two of you. Uh, Giddon, can you, are you still there with us? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so my question was sort of focused on um, one particular aspect of the old world of globalization, namely the free trade agreement. And with the caveat that predictions are impossible and that the US-China relationship is considerably damaged, uh, Joe Biden sort of indicated that he would make labor and environmental standards and the security of the American middle class a precondition of any future free trade agreements. Whereas Donald Trump seems more like a president who might have fewer such worries 
Um, and so I was wondering whether maybe counterintuitively we might, uh, depending on what happens in the election, see more free trade agreements closed in the next four years under a Trump administration than a Biden ad administration. So like, particular with the China deals, Trump seems to be happy to sacrifice structural reform in China for a decreased trade deficit, whereas I can't really see Biden doing that. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. And just so you know, Gideon um, is the manager of the LSC Ideas Economic Diplomacy Commission, which is a very, very important initiative. Um, Emery, would you like to start? Uh, there's a lot there. Uh, so let me start with the absolute decline. Uh, I mean, I don't have all the figures. I would say, uh, I mean, if you just look over my my lifetime, we're, absolutely. I mean, thing, the, again, the quality of our school, ed, our education is appalling. If we can't educate our people, we are never going to be the power that we think uh, we're supposed to be. Again, our healthcare, our, the uh, state of our infrastructure, which is completely appalling, I, I, I won't go through. On the other hand, the United States history is a period, you know, is, is a, also a period of surges and ebbs. And if you go back and look at us at the late, in the late uh, 1890s, you know, you had riots uh, and strike breakers and, and then you had a period of massive reform. And I do believe we're headed for that period of massive reform. And that's what a lot of us are spending our, our time trying to engineer, it has to include political reform. But I will say one other thing, you know, in 2026, we will have our 250th anniversary uh, and we will be on the cusp of moving from a majority white country to a plurality country. And no major democracy has actually made that transition completely. And so many of the problems we see now include these inequalities, who's dying from COVID, Black and brown people versus white people and uh, city people versus uh, others. And th those are huge social divisions. I don't know that we'll make it through, but I, I believe we are in decline now, but we will surge. Um, to my dear friend, William Wallace, Lord Wallace, uh, let me say I am congenitally an optimist. I am an international lawyer and now I run a nonprofit. And if you are not an optimist, you will fail in both of those immediately. Uh, but I'm actually as pessimistic as I get, certainly looking at the state of my own country. Uh, but I think globally, we cannot go back, right? I've been saying for 20 years and many others have, you weren't gonna run the world in 2045 by the institutions that were created in 1945. Countries won't stand for it. People won't stand for it. We did try to evolve. We tried to reform the Security Council and it failed. And at that point, once I accepted that that was just not gonna happen, we're gonna get more revolution than evolution. But, and here's the optimistic part, it's certainly not Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, God help us. That is not what I'm talking about at all. I am saying though, that small and medium states can combine with lots of other powerful groups, with mayors, and I disagree with you. I mean, if you look at the world urbanizing and you look at what those mayors can do, they have their fingers on the pulse of the levers of change we must make. It can't be done by treaty. It has to be done by real local change. Rahm Emanuel just published this book, Nation City. He's, that's, that's a trend that's been happening for 20 years. So what I see that gives me hope are, as I said, impact hubs, hubs that are probably a combination of states, some reinvented international organizations, some foundations, and a bunch of networks that can come together and address specific problems. Uh, and then the, the just the, um, I think I may have missed a question. Oh, can the world afford to decouple from the United States? It won't, it'll decouple from the US government. It won't decouple from US society. Uh, and then finally, I think we might see more uh, free trade agreements under Trump. I do think Biden will be much, much uh, more uh, hamstrung, uh, but I don't think that's going to be the engine of economic growth in the same way that it was because of all the redistrib redistribution requirements. But let me just end by saying globalization 
uh, is a steady long-term trend. I think where I agree with Steve is that it's going to be a different kind of globalization. It's going to be much more embedded. And where we really should be looking is how do we globalize global, uh, global problem solving or political problem solving. And Steve, and just I should say that Amory and Steve have both agreed to stay uh, sort of an extra 10 minutes. I hope that's still okay because we have a long list, so we won't get to everybody's question, but we will we will get um, another good round in. Steve. Um, yeah, so I'll touch on a number of the points that have already been made. Uh, first of all, the, the silver lining, if there is one in this pandemic, is it's reminding Americans and others around the world that having competent and effective public institutions <laughs> is actually a really nice thing. Um, there's been a sort of 50 year war against the public sector in the United States, basically saying, trying to convince people that government was the problem and starving it in a variety of different ways. And we are now seeing the results of that uh, across the board. That is a big reason why we have these so-called deaths of despair uh, that have already been uh, referred to. So you would think in a completely rational political system, we would learn the lesson and begin to adjust and get the kind of reform movement that both Anne-Marie and I would like to see. Uh, what worries me, of course, is the irrational nature of American politics right now, where people with what I would think is absolutely crystal clear evidence staring them in the face uh, keep drawing uh, the wrong conclusions. And I don't uh, know quite how to fix that problem, I I'm afraid. Um, uh, I guess I don't have as much hope that the mayors of the world are going to uh, solve all of these problems for us. Um, and in response to Lord uh, Wallace's comment, I'll just say one other thing is that, you know, nationalism isn't just a powerful force in the United States. It's a powerful force all around, uh, all around the world. And that's, I think, always going to be something of an obstacle to the kind of uh, problem solving uh, we might like to see. Can the world afford to decouple from the U.S., let's just say the U.S. government? Uh, <laughs> of course it can, but doing so will have really significant costs. Um, so the Europeans would have to ask, uh, are they prepared to actually uh, develop the capabilities to defend themselves? Or are, are they going to be able to manage potential rivalries within Europe uh, down the road? Asian countries would have to decide if they were comfortable living in the shadow of Chinese power without the United States being around. Various countries in the Middle East who have long been dependent on American protection of one kind or another would have to decide how they were going to uh, defend themselves. So yes, the world can afford to decouple, but I think a lot of countries would prefer not uh, to do that, if at all possible. Um, and then finally, on the free trade question, um, I guess I, I, it's a great, uh, great question, and it was implicit in what I said. I believe the future of trade agreements is for them to be actually much less intrusive, to impose fewer constraints on what happens inside countries. Uh, recent trade agreements have been uh, as long and detailed and painful to negotiate as they've been because they've tried to reshape what's happening inside uh, all of the various participatory countries. And that's, I think, been one of the reasons they've been hard to negotiate, but also why they've tended to generate something of a political backlash in many places. So I think we're going to be retreating to a much more limited uh, set of trade agreements going forward. I even think that might be true in a Biden administration. Uh, there's one thing you say when you're running for president and the other things that you do once you're confronted with the realities of actually trying to get things done. We're going to go for one um, big round. So you have your pens, <laughs> you have your pens out. Um, I want to come to Peter Watkins and Ian Bond because I know they've again tried to ask questions recently and I haven't gotten to them. So let me come to you first. And then Sophie Zinser from Schwartzman College, Elena, my colleague, um, and Simon Tilford, you can't invite somebody on with a video and not allow them to ask a question. Um, so I think Peter Watkins, if you introduce yourselves, that'd be great. Yeah, so Peter Watkins, previously in the British Ministry of Defence, uh, now an Associate Fellow of Chatham House. Um, just like to pick up, um, actually, Steve's reference to the Europeans. Um, we haven't said very much so far in this uh, discussion about the transatlantic relationship. And I wondered whether both of you might uh, say a bit more about what you think the implications could be. And on multilateral institutions, um, it's, politicians have a choice whether they invest in them or not. So how would, how would you persuade them to do so? Easy question. Um, Ian Bond, over to you. 
Yeah, I am sorry. I'm okay, just ha having trouble unmuting, but I've now unmuted. Uh, thanks very much. Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform. Um, I mean, my, my academic background was, was in um, Latin and Greek and ancient history. And um, I'm, I, you know, at a certain point, political systems um, break down. Uh, and I would love to share Anne-Marie's optimism about major political reform. But, I, you know, I see more evidence of stagnation in the American political system. And I just wonder, you know, what, what can she say to me to, to make me think that actually a system that now seems consistently to deliver Republican majorities for a minority of the popular vote is ever going to reform itself? Sophie? Thank you so much, Leslie. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you um, so much to Leslie, Stephen, and Marie. It's such an honor to hear you speak. Um, going off of your points on how great power competition often consumes discussions of globalization, I'm wondering, um, I read an interesting piece in The Atlantic this week about the way that language um, is evolving homes in America where people haven't spent that much time with um, their families who speak a specific you know, regional language. And I'm wondering if you see a future in which due to quarantine, bringing more people online and maybe an increased number of Americans in the diaspora staying home, speaking native languages with their families and rhetoric might evolve to then influence the way we think about globalization and or that this could be an opportunity for more prevalent international soft power, particularly coming from large diasporas such as India and South Korea to take new forms in the way that Americans think about a more globalized potentially identity going forward. Thank you. And of course, Sophie has more experience with online learning the, than the rest of us because Schwartzman College in Beijing uh, moved, was a first mover in this, in this particular space. She's part of the series. Yes. Um, Elena, over to you. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Um, I repeat what Sophie said, it's really an honor to listen to both of you. I'm Elena Lazaro, I'm an Associate Fellow at Chatham House US and America's program, but I'm also a researcher at the European Parliament's Research Service, uh, currently working on the future of global governance. So my question is, I was listening to Anne-Marie Slaughter speaking, and you were saying in many ways that global, the globalization of the future will be much more state-driven, functional cooperation to solve problems and possibly multi-stakeholder. And that's all great, but I'm wondering if it isn't missing something that, um, that was embodied in the, original, in the original idea of global governance and institutions, which was not to just be reactive to crisis, but also to create rules and norms. And I think I sound very 1990s where I say this, but you didn't mention uh, Ruggie. And you know, I remember these concepts of diffuse reciprocity and everyone was going to be part of it to get something out of it. So I'm wondering, do you see this future globalization being much more about reacting to problems rather than setting um, norms and sort of being normative about the future? And if so, how will the least developed countries um, I, I think they will not profit from it in many ways, but I'd really like to think, uh, to listen to your views on that. Thank you. Sorry, I know I'm giving you a lot of questions, but this is the last one. I just want to also get Laurie Dumden in. I think Laurie would be very disappointed not to be able to ask you a question, Emery. So Laurie, are you still on the call? Hi, yeah, I'm still on the call. I'm not sure if I have video or not, but I'll keep it very brief. Um, I'm working with Chatham House's Inclusive Governance Initiative, where we're trying to do some thinking about these types of questions of agent, shifting agency and uh, the spearhead of different actors that have been coming to the head in recent years around global challenges and what that might mean for global governance in all the different types of ways we've been talking about it on this call. I wanna just pick up quickly on the Impact Hub idea and building from there, if we're thinking about impact hubs and governance contributors and dri governance drivers, as we have we seen in some areas around digital governance, around climate, environmental issues, there become almost a proliferation of initi initiatives. So how do we think through how these individual new constructive innovative forms of governance can interact with existing models? Are there ways, are there insertion points? Are there ways to avoid kind of getting towards, instead of treaty shopping, impact hub shopping, um, you know, kind of issue by issue fragmentation to the point that we lose the efficiency of resources? 
that we lose the opportunity for some of the for some sub-state actors or non-state actors to be able to cross-fertilize and institutions and public authorities to cross-fertilize with them. So just, you know, some of these operational questions, if there's any thinking about should we or should we not try to insert them into existing processes? Great question. We just have Simon Tilfer, but I also notice I can see the wonderful thing about camera is I can see my director lurking in the background who's going to say hello because he's coming from another meeting. So we'll get Robin Niblett in as well. But Simon Tilford, um, Robin Niblett, just to say hello, and then back to the two of you. I'm afraid, you. Leslie, I was actually off for the last couple of minutes because we lost power, but I'm back. Okay. So I missed. You've got, you've got so many questions here that <laughs> <laughs> I missed a few. Sorry. <laughs> and you can see that Robin has also now just joined us from his meetings. Um, so uh, Simon, you, you, your, your turn. Thank you, Leslie. Terrific discussion. We've heard a lot about the domestic policy challenges facing the US. So this is obviously a hugely productive, uh, wealthy country, yet has massive uh, sort of domestic um, socioeconomic issues. One question I think is whether the US will tire of being uh, the safe haven for the world's capital. So we hear an awful lot about the exorbitant privilege afforded to the US by the dominance of the US dollar. And that exorbitant privilege is real, but we hear very little about the costs to the US of providing that safe asset. That is, we hear very little about what accommodating huge capital in inflows does to the structure of the US economy. After all, it's worth bearing in mind that this is not a country that needs capital. The US does, is not short of capital. It has as much capital as, capital as it needs. The flip side of all of these inflows is dollar strength, very low domestic savings, a huge trade deficit, and more rapid than otherwise deindustrialization. The US doesn't have a huge trade deficit because it's living beyond its means. It has a huge trade deficit because we're seeing mass or massive capital inflows into the country, which force it to run a trade deficit. Now, I don't believe the Chinese will ever stop buying treasuries. They can't afford to do that. But what happens if the US decides it doesn't want, cannot afford to accommodate these capital inflows? Can we foresee, for example, the US imposing some kind of capital controls at some point? What would happen? I, the reason why I ask this is that when the UK could no longer perform uh, the role that the US now performs, the US was able, albeit reluctant, to take over. But there's no one to take over from the US. Uh, China certainly is not ready. Europe can't for all manner of reasons. But what happens if the US decides it can no longer do this? <coughs> So you have, you have a tremendous number of questions. We know that you won't be able to answer them all. So I'm going to let you choose. Steve, I'm gonna let you go first, and then Anne-Marie, and then I think Robin hasn't had the pleasure, but I'm still gonna give him a word at the end to say at least hello as director of Town House. No getting off the hook. The camera is there in everybody's living room. And I should say, I love seeing everybody's books and, and any manner of thing in the background. It's just, I've seen a few children on this call. It's just fabulous. Um, Professor Stephen Walt, Harvard Kennedy School, over to you. Uh, uh, well, there's no way to do justice to all of these questions, but I will try. Uh, on transatlantic relations, you know, I've been a secular pessimist uh, on that for a long, long time. Uh, I think, uh, as I said before, the one thing uh, I see going forward is if, uh, if Sino-American competition continues to heat up, uh, it will not be possible for Europe to sit that one out on the sidelines and simultaneously expect the United States to be sort of a first responder on security issues in Europe. Uh, Europe will ultimately have to make that choice, and I'm not saying what choice Europe should make, but they uh, aren't going to be able to sit that one uh, sit that one out. In terms of how you would convince people to invest in international institutions, I think you simply have to remind them uh, that in any kind of interconnected world, you need some rules to manage that. When I teach this, I always say, you know, back when we used to fly airplanes to other countries, you needed some rules uh, so that the planes wouldn't hit each other. And you can just magnify that example um, uh, many times over. Um, I, I am, uh, uh, Ian Bond's comment about political breakdown, uh, that's of course what we all fear, that we just have gotten ourselves into a dysfunctional cycle we can't get ourselves out of. Uh, I occasionally remind myself that the United States does do really strange things occasionally. In 2008, we uh, elected uh, the first black president who actually had a Muslim name and his name sounded even a little bit like Osama. 
Uh, and that was a kind of a remarkable thing for the United States to do seven years after 9-11. Uh, so I, I continue to hope that we are uh, capable of that kind of, uh, of innovation. Uh, Sophie Zinser's comment about languages and will that uh, create a greater uh, sort of identity politics, identity awareness uh, with the multicultural Americans and their connections around the world. Uh, that, that's an interesting possibility. I really don't know if it's true. If it is true, it means, again, a less European focus because the United States you know, used to be almost entirely uh, descended from people who, from, uh, of European background. Uh, that will be less true in the future. And again, the sort of national consciousness will be more global, less transatlantic uh, going forward. Um, on the question of, of rules and norms and do we still need them, I think I've already said that uh, a little bit. Um, I'll just point out something though, that there's um, uh, a question with this sort of bottom up notions of cooperation. Um, first of all, if you have lots of different impact hubs uh, that are all creating their own problems or rather their own solutions, how does one integrate them? How does one make sure that you don't get essentially sort of the malign competition where a regional association in one place starts to compete with another regional association. In the American context, this is why we went to the Constitution as opposed to the original Articles of Confederation. Um, and again, it gets me back to this point about uh, nationalism. Um, you know, the, I, I think of examples of places like, uh, like Hungary uh, where they want to accept some of the rules that are out there. They like subsidies from the EU. They like trading with other EU members, but they don't like the cosmopolitanism that is embedded uh, in the EU and some of its legal strictures as well. So I worry about a sort of a decentralized globalization where in fact these different rules start uh, really competing with one another. Uh, I am not enough of an economist to know what the, the costs of, uh, to the United States of its, uh, the global role of the dollar and, and all of that. I guess all I would say is this to me is one reason why Larry Summers was right to say the past decade has been a period where we should have been investing enormously in infrastructure be precisely because we have these enormous uh, piles of capital sitting around and interest rates are incredibly low. And that would have been a much way, better way uh, to spend some of that money as opposed to allowing it to simply stuff the portfolios of the 1% in the United States. But uh, whether or not we'll actually be able to change that again or what, or what the economics of that would look like going forward is above my pay grade or outside my disciplinary specialty. I will stop there. Thank you um, for your modesty as well as your eloquence and breadth. Um, Anne-Marie, and we've lost you visually, by the way, Steve, but you- Yeah, I, I don't know what the problem there is. I, I can hear you all just fine, but uh, my screen's been frozen for the most of the hour. We've got every single word very, very articulate. So we've got you all there intellectually. Emory, over to you. All right. Uh, so I, I will start where Steve ended with Simon Tilford's question and say, I also uh, really am not competent to answer the the question, except to say that uh, I'm quite certain Donald Trump, should he be reelected, could not possibly understand what you are talking about, given that he has a basic mercantilist, you know, more inflows are better than outflows view. Uh, but the long term is a point that, that uh, is a very interesting one. And I, I honestly have not even really seen it raised very much. So I'll, I'm not going to answer it, but, but I think it's a very interesting question. Let me then move from domestic uh, to international and, and answer uh, or try to answer Ian Bond's question about um, political reform. And again, I, I start by saying 100 years ago, we elected senators through the upper houses of our legislatures and we didn't have primaries uh, and the, the political system looked like a mess. You had a, a third party uh, election in 1912, and then you did have major political reform. And uh, one state has already, so the, the answer is to move to multi-party democracy, not a parliamentary system. We can't do that without a constitutional amendment, but we can have multi-party democracy if we simply change our electoral system, which we could, every state can do uh, simply by voting. There's no need for a constitutional convention. 
Uh, and indeed, Maine has moved to rank choice voting, which is effectively just means you rank the, the people in order. It means that you can have third parties without being spoilers. It incentivizes moderation uh, and compromise uh, and a growing number. We've got about 30 American cities that have adopted it and it's on the ballot in a number of states. Uh, so if I look at it, I see uh, the sign, I mean, there's a real desire uh, for that kind of political reform and that would really dramatically change uh, our politics. If it doesn't happen, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, then moving to the transatlantic relationship and then coming back ultimately to this vision of global governance. From my point of view, the only way to really salvage the, tra to, to make the transatlantic relationship that we have had, the Northern Atlantic, uh, European American transatlantic relationship, the only way to make a transatlantic relationship that kind of a pillar is to make it the entire Atlantic hemisphere so that you are engaging Africa and Latin America as much as Europe and North America. That's again because of our demography and Steve touched on this. Right? We have the strongest ties with Europe of anywhere in the world because the majority of Americans were of European ancestry. But Latinx Americans are looking South. Asian Americans are looking West. Uh, and But there are, if you take the entire Atlantic, you've got tremendous opportunities uh, to strengthen that relationship. But the European-American relationship was already sliding under Obama, who didn't care about the special relationship, much less Trump. And, and uh, Biden might be a throwback, uh, but, but he is a 20th century politician. It won't last over the course of the century. So then come to the, I think, a really central question about this more decentralized, multi-hub uh, order. So first thing to say is you absolutely do need both. I mean, as Steve says, domestically, we, you know, we would be far better off right now if we had a strong central government that had adopted a national pandemic strategy, created a pandemic testing board, uh, uh, mandated uh, supply chains to provide tests and treatment, uh, and then allowed governors and mayors and county health authorities to actually implement it. That absolutely is the ideal, you need both. Uh, and so I'm not saying you can move to a world where you just have a whole bunch of random hubs and they will somehow solve problems. We, I think probably the G20 is our best bet going forward of an, uh, uh, a, a sort of global steering group because it exists and because it's very hard to imagine uh, getting a smaller one. And if you get much bigger, you're not going to be very effective, although you can bring in the heads of regional organizations. When the U.S. won't play, that makes it much harder to, to do anything through the G20, but you do need some smaller steering group. At the same time, though, again, if you look at the nature of the problems I'm talking about, from health to climate to migration to cybersecurity, these are the kinds of problems that require change at the very local level. And so I continue to say, we need mayors, governors, small and medium-sized states, and uh, global actors from business to civil society. How will you make that efficient? And this is the, the, the final piece, but it's essential, is you need real metrics of impact. So if I were convincing investors to support global health, I would say they should invest in the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization more than the WHO. Why? Because I can prove to you that the Gavi has had a greater impact. Impact investors all over the world are developing those metrics because they need them to direct capital. And I think we can have a competition among different kinds of hubs that are state and non-state together in terms of what they actually accomplish. The capital will follow uh, and it, it, it's messy but it is the kind of 20th century, 21st century emergent network, uh, complicated system approach that many of us would like to, to go back to a simpler world, but I don't see how we can. And I think it's the only way forward. So much in there. I wanna say two quick things and I wanna see if Robin at a minimum will say hello. I can't imagine for a minute that he doesn't have any reactions to everything that's just been said, even coming in late. One is, um, you know, there is a difference between the US not playing ball and the US being obstructionist. And, you know, it's possible that the US may continue to not play ball in any number of elements 
um, even with a new administration, but obstruction is something quite different and we've seen it in extraordinary form. I, but I also wanted to pick up on Emory's point about um, Asian Americans looking East and Latin Americans looking South and European Americans looking West. And I think there's something to that, but I think we can't deny that it's not, and I'm sure you don't, don't mean to say it, but I think sometimes we, we slip into thinking that it's about our racial composition and not about the changing power dynamics. As we know, this generation of Americans like Sophie, right, head off to Beijing because uh, they know where the dynamism, they, they know where the GDP is, they know where the power is. Um, and it clearly is impacted by racial diversity and composition. But it, it, I think it's, as as I'm sure you agree. Um, it's not a centralist. Yes. It's not a centralist. Um, not. I obviously say that as a you know mixed race American, so I always have to make that a point. But I, but I know you don't you don't mean that. That was an extraordinary number of comments. This was an extraordinary amount of contributions from Mark and Sophie and, and Lord Wallace who put more questions in the chat line and uh, Laurie Dundon and so many people. Um, but Robin as director of Chatham House as a full member of the project that Amory and I and many others are doing together for uh, the Lloyd George project. So we have another round in a few weeks. Robin gets to say something. He hasn't seen Steve Walt in person in a little while. so. Over to you, Robin, to um, wrap things up for us. Well, I made the big mistake of exactly stepping by this desk earlier, but i um, really, really pleased that I got to sit down and listen to those final comments by Steve and Anne-Marie. Really sorry, guys, not to have been with you and everyone else through this conversation, but it was a meeting involving our chairman and various members of our board, so only that would have pulled me away from uh, this event with Leslie. Um, uh, just two comments then at the end. A, it would have been lovely to have heard more of this before uh, we had to send our final draft, Leslie and I, because it sounds like there's a lot of good material to adapt already our chapter with. Um, you'll probably be doing the same maybe, Amory, with parts of yours, or maybe not. I'm sure yours is perfect as it's been oh. finished already. Um, <laughs> but um, well, I thought Simon Tilford, Simon, good to see you. I think I owe you a reply to an email, apologies. Um, but Simon's comment there really hit me for a second because it did make me think about that moment in 1971, not that I remember it very clearly myself, but I think it was a pretty big moment for the global economy when the US secretively, unilaterally, um, separated the dollar from uh, convertibility to gold and literally threw the whole world economy into a complete loop. So when we think things are exceptional and wild at moments like this and that America can be unilateral, um, we need to think back to its historical uh, antecedents and uh, think about what that tells us about the future. We better be a bit more resilient. Um, I agree with Steve. I think on security, the West is probably going to have to choose, and that includes the UK. Um, you know, America is the guarantor of our security. But I think to uh, Anne-Marie's points on global governance, Europeans, and I include the Brits in this, are going to look for much more inventive types of, uh, of partnerships. And we'll be able to, because I think America, China, some of the other big powers will go their own way, India probably as well. But uh, Europe in the end is a collection of medium-sized powers, including the UK, whether we're in the EU or out of it. And we're gonna to have to look for those more creative types of solutions that Anne-Marie was mentioning. So that's my little takeaway from the last 10 minutes. Thank goodness uh, that Leslie, while being a brilliant chair, is an appalling timekeeper. And so she's gone so far over time that I was able to stay in along with 44 other participants. So what the hell, this is fantastic. Um, thanks guys. Um, I'm just going to say, I always believe we should not switch off. We should always unmute and applaud at moments like this. We will, yes, we will exactly. applaud it. I did have their, their agreement to go on longer. I, oh, good. <laughs> academic uh, interventions never get done in 60 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Emory. Thank you, Steve Walt. You are tremendous, and we are so grateful. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.